Um, so now we would like to turn our discussion to strategic partnerships that emerge through mergers and acquisitions and how they can enhance a value-based approach to healthcare. Uh, before I introduce the panelists, I'm going to quickly play a little game. It's very simple rules. I'm going to read a statement, and you guys decide whether the statement is true or false. Um, this is for pride. We will be awarding no prizes, so <laughs> uh, just something to sort of lighten the mood. Um, according to the CMS, 561 ACOs participated in the Medicare Shared Savings Program at the end, as of the end of 2018. Who thinks that's true? Just a couple. Who thinks it's false? Who doesn't want to participate in my game? <laughs> Um, the answer is true, and we'll be playing this little game in between all of the panels, so next time I want more participation. Now I will introduce our lovely panel. Um, first I'd like to introduce Mark Dubo, Director at Verilon, Debbie Gersh, Partner at Ropes and Gray, John Weigand, Attorney at the Federal Trade Commission, and Kathy Blake, Senior Vice President, Healthcare Quality at American Medical Association. And Kathy, I will turn it over to you to get things started. Great. Well, thank you so much. And that was certainly a great overview and introduction, I think, that we just heard. And so we're going to take a little bit of a shift and um, really look at some of the legal dimensions associated with what I think we could all agree is a great deal of activity in the area of mergers, new models of care, new relationships, et cetera. And so the first question I'd have for the panelists is um, just tell this audience, what kinds of new players are you seeing? What kinds of new relationships? And I might start with Mark and Debbie. Well, great. Thank you very much. Uh, when I think about emerging innovators in the healthcare field, they really come in, in two different categories. There are the established firms that are bringing new solutions to the healthcare environment and they're the new entrants. And when you think about those collectively, they really fall into about six categories. The first category would be the data firms. So with data firms, you think about IBM Watson Health, you think about Google, you think about Optum, you think about Babylon, Microsoft, and, and the organizations like that. Second category would be the firms that are in the device, the diagnostic device and mobile health sphere. And so you think of Apple, you think of uh, Fitbit, Nike, uh, all the companies that are producing wearables. Perhaps many of you have wearables uh, with you today. You also think about uh, firms that have remote monitoring capability and uh, the tablet or physician kiosks uh, like uh, American Well. The third category would be organizations that are uh, basically tailoring medical equipment to new purposes and bringing innovation in that regard. And there are a whole host of them, and one of them would be Philips. Another category would be the, uh, what I'll call the, the biotech or bioengineering firms. And so you think about the companies that are developing artificial fluids, artificial tissues, bones, organs, all of the 3D printing that's out there. And you think about the robotics companies that are enabling uh, interaction between physicians and patients. Another category would be the insurers who are merging and or forming relationships with, with the providers. And so you think of a Aetna CVS or United and, and Optum. And then there's a category that we all generally call retail, which really is two categories in one. One of the categories would be the retail pharmacies like a, a Walgreens, a CVS, a, a Rite Aid. And the second is the consumer big box stores like a Walmart or a Costco or a Target. So there are a lot of players in this field, a lot of emerging innovators. Debbie, what are you seeing? So um, it, it, just as a follow-up to what Mark has said, I think I divide it slightly differently, but really consistently. Um, I think there is the payer provider component, which we'll start with. I think that's been quite interesting. Many folks thought when value-based care came in, the provider, the payer, sorry, had the key, the key to the kingdom because of all the data that they held. And what we found is while that is largely true and, the, and money does drive this, that the providers are key to that. And a lot of folks thought that this was a passing fad. And I know that's something that Kathy will talk about a little bit later. But I think what was surprising here is that because there is a real upside, uh, there is a real need for everybody to come together based upon a lot of the initiatives that the government went 
you know, put forward with respect to quality, efficiency, all, all those components. I think there was a re re-energy, that's not really a word, but in, it, it, we, we, re, we were re-energized in that regard because people actually saw an upside. And what we saw, which was very unusual, was actual engagement in the payer provider network, uh, the risk take, taking, because what we had started to see was a lot of risk shifting. Payers were looking to providers to take on more risk. And with that co-engagement, I think there has been a lot of consolidation, and you mentioned quite a few of them, um, e even from the more traditional or the less traditional CDS Aetna type to a lot of provider consolidation that we've seen. We've also seen the medical device companies get involved um, and looking to basically take risk. Uh, for example, there was a, a big deal announced by Medtronic publicly with the glucose monitoring and the ability if things were not done properly or within certain parameters or certain results weren't accomplished, that there would be risk taking um, on their side from a payer. And then just one last example with Sparks and um, a retina uh, dystrophy uh, medication on the pharmacy side if, if certain things were not achieved as far as metrics and solving for that issue and disease, that there would be a repayment or rebate. So I think that combination of shared risk and looking to increase care is something that has really, really taken by storm, I think, the market and in a commercial setting unlike we've seen in the past. So thank you. And I think what you're hearing then is that there is a panoply of players, some of them traditional, but evolving. Some of them are new entrants that we might not have previously thought of. So I'll turn to John next and say, you're in the position of having to evaluate all of these arrangements, maybe not all of them, but certainly some of them. And so what's your sense? And um, do you think that this is um, a situation that is increasing competition? Or is it, um, are there concerns that you have or that the commission has about these new relationships? Sure, and I need to say at the outset that I'm speaking here today um, on my, uh, with my own views and I may not represent the views of the commissioner, the commission or any individual commissioner. That disclaimer having been I said. I could have said that for you. <laughs> that, that, I knew that, that was coming. That disclaimer having been said. Um, no, the, the marketplace is experiencing a lot of new entry, um, but a lot of the transactions also um, are analyzed from our viewpoint as consolidation. And it's very traditional for us to look at um, transactions which are horizontal in nature, where we have two firms that have been engaging in direct competition uh, to consolidate. We have some very standard tools for addressing those situations. We, we define a particular product market, we define a geographic market, we look at the, the market shares, calculate a, a concentration level, and then we look at um, whether uh, entry is difficult or easy because who cares how high concentration is if entry is really easy. And then finally we look at the uh, potential efficiencies to see whether they may outweigh any potential anti-competitive effects. So, you know, that's, that's a pretty standard analysis. We've used that in combinations of uh, hospitals, combinations of retail drug stores, combinations of physician organizations. Um, what is, what is um, coming to the forefront now are combina uh, combinations that have a vertical aspect or have a mix of vertical and horizontal aspect. And one particular illustrative, uh, illustrative uh, investigation involved renowned health, health up in Reno. A hospital system there uh, decided to, to acquire one of the two major cardiology groups in Reno. We had no objection to that. We didn't even open an investigation of it. But then they did something that surprised the healthcare community there um, and, the, and the cardiologist. They decided to buy the other cardiology group. Now, um, a new, unusual situation because the first cardiology group reacted to the second acquisition rather much like the first wife reacts to the husband bringing home wife number two in a polygamous society. 
not very well. Um, so they wanted out, and we were looking to break up that concentration in cardiology services, so we almost had a ready-made remedy in that situation because the original cardiology group uh, members were very eager to leave. But um, sometimes those kinds of acquisitions are, are analyzed after the fact and very hard to get a remedy. So we have to be innovative, creative, and, and, and quicker than you might expect a federal bureaucracy to be. So wonderful that you've cited an example in cardiology. I am a cardiologist and from a community where that was certainly a very, very active discussion uh, point, how large could different groups become? What did that mean with regard to access to insurance, uh, beneficiaries, uh, medical staff privileges, et cetera? And um, I can tell you that it's complicated and uh, we relied on our council for a lot of help during that. So I'm gonna shift gears a bit and ask next, um, the panelists to talk about when you are examining these kinds of arrangements, uh, there are two parties. And I think we sometimes think about um, what it might mean for a community, what it might mean for the healthcare system writ large. But what is it, do you think, when a group, let's say, like United, but it could be others, um, are seeking to either purchase or partner with a provider organization. What are they looking for? And so therefore, on the provider side, which I would say I'm more likely to live on, what should I be thinking about, preparing for, um, and be prepared actually to represent if I'm on one side of that table? So I'll start either Debbie or Mark. I'm happy to start. And I'm gonna approach this from a strategic standpoint because that's the, the world that I spend most of my time in. And I think to use your example, Kathy, um, if I think about the healthcare information companies and their interaction with the insurers, and maybe Optum United is a good example. There, there are others, of course. And I think, what are they trying to achieve when they form their provider networks? And in essence, they use their provider networks as an alternative to those that are already in the marketplace. I think as they're going out looking for members of their provider network and trying to decide where to focus their attention, they're really looking at three things. They're looking for uh, who can provide the geographic coverage and the capacity necessary to uh, deliver the access that they're promising to the marketplace. They're looking for organizations that can really deliver effective and efficient care management because that's part of the, the value base purchasing orientation that they're taking, the risk that they're taking. And they're looking also for the ability to deliver care in a lower cost environment. And the reason that you see an Optum United focus on acquiring primary care physicians, acquiring urgent care centers, acquiring uh, ambulatory surgical centers, is because those ambulatory entities fit that opportunity to deliver lower cost care. Now, there's a different angle to all of this, and it wasn't the question you asked, but I think it might be of value to, uh, to our audience here, and that is uh, there are other organizations, other in inventors, other um, innovators, who are forming relationships. Some of these other relationships aren't necessarily acquisitions. They may be contractual. They might be joint ventures. They, too, are looking for providers, but they're, from a strategic standpoint, looking for something a little bit different. They're looking for rapid entry to the market. So will the providers that they are forming these relationships enable that? They're looking for uh, also low cost delivery mechanisms. They're looking for a large insured pool of patients, preferably commercially insured because that generates a revenue stream for these organizations. And lastly, I think what they're looking for is a, an organization or a set of organizations that have strong brand identity. And you might wonder why, why that's significant. Well, as soon as you start to couple strong brand identity with these new services, these new products, the new uh, innovative solutions, you are in many ways endorsing those solutions. And I think that's significant. Debbie? 
So I think care coordination is one of the other key components here. Mm -hmm. and, a, and what we're starting to see is the need to consolidate that with the information that we've now gathered. I think even 10 years ago, when you looked at what data was available, it was held, as I alluded to earlier, by payers. And I think as a provider, there is the ability combined to control and negotiate not only those fees, because I think providers recognize that they need to take risk, um, but also the, the data component that becomes extremely important. And I think as that shared data um, evolves and matures, the ability to use that data in a helpful manner and a thoughtful manner becomes really um, important and I think has been the driver for a lot of the innovation that's gone on and the driver to lower cost settings as you alluded to because the hospital setting doesn't work as well as it used to from the standpoint of you just went to the hospital, you were treated and you left with so much outpatient and other things but cost being a consideration. You've seen a lot of changes in the marketplace. Even academic medical centers are affiliating with smaller community hospitals, outpatient centers, as again you, you mentioned, and overall lower cost care, moving from an acute care setting to home health which has also been a significant change. Um, and I know that reimbursement, and there's been a lot of drive toward reimbursement for home health at home health, not just at a facility or transcending that, but looking to take care of people at homes for lower cost care. So I think all of those, along with the data, has allowed us to manage better um, the population management component. And one last thing is that we always talk about healthcare as being national, regional, and local, and we've seen a lot of big splash national deals and mega mergers. But if you look at the, by, you know, the components of that, they're designed to provide increased access to communities and local areas and encourage people to seek health um, advice earlier than they had previously. I might just add, and then I have a follow-up question for John to answer, that um, what we are seeing at the American Medical Association and what we are hearing from physicians um, running large practices is that we can talk about data writ large. What the insurers have is they have claims data. What the clinicians have is they have clinical data that comes from the electronic health record system that is not necessarily available to the payers, um, payer being either a plan or the actual business paying the premiums. And so what our sense has been is that some of this interest in joining up in that way is that you then have different but complementary, um, almost synergistic data for conducting the kind of analyses uh, that you would like to conduct. We, full disclosure, have just entered into an agreement with United Health Group. What are we talking about? And it's the AMA with United Health Group. Very specifically, social determinants of health. So you heard at the last talk how important that is, but it's wickedly difficult to code it and get it into your electronic system. So we're working together to start to have a standard set of codes to be put forward to the World Health Organization to then be able to capture some of the things that were mentioned. So John, you're on the uh, hot seat again. So as you hear about all of these relationships, new kinds of relationships with respect to data, and I think we all realize that you need a certain um, size of practice, of organization, to be able to get the full benefits of data I've heard numbers as high as a million covered lives to be able to truly take risk. So does that raise concerns for you, your colleagues, in terms of saying size is essential for these risk-taking relationships to work, but size might become anti-competitive? Sure, there, there is a tension there, but it's not a new tension because for years we've needed to pay attention to um, making sure that a hospital or a physician organization had a sufficient number of units produced to reach uh, 
reasonable quality level. So we've always had to pay attention to you know, a critical mass or, or a size that was going to deliver the kind of quality that uh, the marketplace demands. So you know, we'd look at, at you know, mergers of, say, uh, hospital obstetric programs. And, and each hospital is delivering 95 babies a year. And we say, well, you know, there's, there's a trade-off here that we recognize, and, and a, a number of, in, in some cases, we approve a merger because the combination of the two entities is necessary to get the kind of volume that is required from the quality point of view. Now, when we're looking at things from a, a, a bigger data set or um, looking at uh, clinically integrated medical practices. Again, we're, going, we're, we're, we're looking at the analysis from the point of view of the purchaser. Now, in the old days, we would say, well, the purchaser is an individual patient, and we have to look at, say, if we're analyzing a physician organi organization merger, we need to look at, at each medical specialty separately. After all, if you need uh, attention to a brain tumor, the fact that cardiac catheterization is on sale this week doesn't help you at all, right? So we've had to look at product lines um, in the past based on medical specialty. And some people are, are, are still approaching, uh, some purchasers are still approaching medicine in that way. They're, you know, they're looking to purchase particularly specialized uh, uh, services. But there's also a purchaser, say, uh, a health plan that is looking to buy uh, clinically integrated physician services. And they want to buy that from a large IPA or from a large medical group. So from their point of view, the product market is not cardiologists or neurologists or anesthesiologists, but rather it is a clinically integrated physician organization, whether that's uh, an IPA with the physicians maintaining their individual practices and, and some control over them, or whether it's more of a staff model medical group, one way or the other, those two business models compete to provide clinically integrated care. And health plans are looking to buy that, particularly on the HMO side. So we have to analyze that market as well as the individual physician services markets. So it's complicated. It's complicated <laughs> and it's, it's not either or. We have to look at the market from both perspectives because we have different sets of customers. And from an antitrust viewpoint, we're always looking at markets from the customer's standpoint. The purchaser, are they going to face, um, as a result of the merger, an, an increase in price um, that um, relates to the consolidation? And we have to adjust, of course, price for you know, quality adjusted price. We don't want to be overly simplistic about it, but we do want to ensure that the consolidation under consideration does not lead to an anti-competitive price increase. Further thoughts before we go on to our next question? Can I just ask you a question? Sorry about that. But on the risk side, to Kathy's point, if they're really taking risk, if they're receiving payment and taking risk, does that change your thought process at all? The, ans the answer to that is that um, taking risk is an important indice of, of integration, right? And we can look at risk taking from the point of view of capitated contracting or shared savings or uh, withholds or bonuses based on a pay for performance kind of, of model. And physicians consolidating into a joint venture that is sharing risk are not going to be subject to attack on the price fixing grounds. Mm -hmm. but, there's, but the organization that they're forming still needs to be analyzed on a market power basis to determine whether that entity is going to be of sufficient size that it's going to be able to use its market share to negotiate a higher price from health plans. So the issue of risk takes us to a next area that we had decided in advance we wanted to talk about, which is that there are some very innovative new models for practice. 
And these are entities that are assuming total risk. And the risk that they're assuming or the populations that they are taking that risk for are in the Medicaid arena and in communities where there is a deficit of healthcare services and where there are very severe challenges associated with the social determinants of health. So two come to mind. Uh, one is Oak Street Health, which began, I believe, in Chicago and has been very effective so far, now across multiple communities. And then City Block, which has developed out of New York and is similarly taking a very holistic approach to high-risk individuals. So I'm interested in Debbie and then Mark, your thoughts about these kinds of radically different ways of assuming risk. We always think risk is, I'll take risk on maybe the easier populations. These are practices taking risk for individuals with high needs. So it, it's a really good question and interesting as we've watched this develop. Um, but I, a lot of these groups have quite a bit of confidence in their ability to manage that care for that price. And it, it also is the size of the group that they're managing. And granted, these tend to be higher risk uh, folks. But the data, the, data, the analytics, the um, population health management statistics that they have gathered has really helped them. I have to hedge this a little bit. But, but it, it does allow them for, to manage care. And they have nurse care. They have PA care. A lot of the care doesn't need to necessarily be done by the physician. And care coordination and care management has become critical. And what, they have, what has been shown generally is that there's going to be up times and down times. Right, just with any any risk, um, but in using in using technology and in using uh, case coordinators to help more holistically treat those patients, they find they found better adherence, um, and they found better imp and improved behavior by folks. So it really is. I, I think a lot of those folks, uh, a lot of people were worried that they would fail, and others kind of hoped they'd fail in that odd way because of fear. No, because of fear of risk, right? It's always been something that's been challenged. If you look back in the days of per member per month, and everyone thought, oh my gosh, capitation. And we know that was quite fearfully received because a lot of specialists were getting three cents per member per month, and if they had one bad case, it was terrible. But I think um, taking this on, and then also a lot also put in for bonuses and other uh, uh, and other related payments to up that, so it's not solely. But interestingly, the interaction, reaching out to folks through, um, whether it's through telephonically, through people interacting with their devices, and all those things, that interaction and investment in health, and as you noted, the social determinants, and having them engaged in, engaged in appropriate diet and whatnot has been helpful. We've worked not just with them, but with other groups um, who have found that if you bring folks in and teach them how to make a meal and monitor it, and they can watch their progress, they can watch their blood sugar levels come down, their cholesterol, there is an engagement there. And I know that's not quite your question, but I think it's the more holistic piece that has really, they've proven it, and uh, good for them. And they know their patients, and they all talk to each other, which always helps. Um, it's kind of like a small town or exactly. a big family. It goes to the community. If you know your population and know what their needs are and are more engaged in that, you will actually do better and, quite honestly, get uh, better results. What? So I generally agree with what Debbie said, and perhaps I'll draw attention to a, a subset of that. I certainly, I agree with the, the importance of the information in making decisions and in managing the care process. Uh, one of the things that I think you see in these organizations, and you alluded to it, Debbie, was that they're not using the traditional healthcare providers alone. You have a pretty substantial use of nurse practitioners, physician assistants, and a wide array of uh, individuals that are licensed in different disciplines than our traditional healthcare providers. Uh, but importantly, a significant component when we think about managing the, the uh, social determinants 
is engaging community organizations as collaborators in this process. And so what you start to see are arrangements with school systems, arrangements with social service organizations in the communities, arrangements with the law enforcement organizations in the community, so that all parties are contributing and playing a role. And that uh, not only brings expertise to the table and different points of contact by those organizations with the, the individuals in the community, uh, but it also diffuses the cost. And I think one of the challenges that providers wrestle with, whether they're physician organizations like those that you mentioned, Kathy, or whether they are hospitals, is, gee, how can we take on that entire uh, task? And so it's engaging a broad network uh, and a non-traditional network is critical. One of the things that we're starting to hear um, physicians and others talk about is that they have to have resources within the community to which they can refer the patients that they see because they're not going to be able to set up necessarily the food bank or the safe shelter or whatever additional services might be needed. And there's even been discussion of what we might call the moral hazard, the feeling that if you find out about something that needs that kind of attention and you do not have those resources readily at hand, then you'll, you'll die trying to deliver those resources, but far better that they be integrated into uh, care. I'm going to shift gears um, again because we had a lot to think about and to share with you. And uh, this will be my last question um, before we do a quick uh, final up and see if there are any questions from all of you. I think it's almost impossible uh, to not, in this panel, ask a question and just say, what do you think um, Warren Buffett and um, Jeff Bezos and uh, is it Oh, the fellow at J.P. Morgan. What, what are they doing with this new entity called now Haven, uh, which has kind of, to our, my sense, been sort of going under the radar, but with players that big, what do you think we should expect to see in terms of disruption, scale, um, and impact everywhere else? So I might start maybe Mark, and we'll come down, all three of you. I'll address it from a perspective that might be a little bit different than my colleagues here on the panel, and, and we'll see how that plays. So I, I think about the three parties, and they really have different interests in this game. And it's my sense that Amazon has really collaborated with J.P. Morgan and, and Warren Buffett's Berkshire Hathaway because those organizations represent large employer groups with specific health care needs and they're a willing participant in this experiment to how to redesign health care delivery and make it more effective, efficient, and lower cost. So I think it's a collaboration of sorts. Uh, what Haven is, what it will become, is, is really something that's in a very uh, significant evolutionary stage, and it's difficult to predict what the end result is. Having said that, I think it's important to stop and realize what kind of organization Amazon is. Amazon is an organization that, in essence, disintermediates delivery systems, whether we're talking about their point of origin books, or whether we're talking about pharmaceuticals, an area that they've shown some interest in lately, or medical supplies. And one could extend that if one stops to think, well, how would Amazon play a role going forward in re-engineering healthcare delivery and redirecting care so that it's more cost and um, um, management effective and efficient? One would begin to think, well, perhaps Amazon would like to disintermediate primary care. Now, I would say that I have not heard anyone say that directly. I haven't seen that in print but I'm just trying to connect some dots and think about where their core skill is and how they might change healthcare delivery. And so I think Amazon is really the driver of Haven and JP Morgan and Berkshire Hathaway are participating with the intent of overall re-engineering the healthcare effectiveness and, and delivery system. So that's fairly provocative. I heard the words disintermediate primary care at the same time, though, we hear that there is a desperate need for more 
individuals who are capable of delivering primary care. So just with that sidebar comment, Debbie? Well, I look at it slightly more cynically, and for anyone who knows me, that would not shock anyone. Um, but it, it's, it's like a mini business and a mini insurance company. And not to make light of it at all, but it's a million, two, million, four lives that you're dealing with. I think there's a frustration by entities who are, that are self-insured, um, and they see the rising cost. And it's, it's an ERISA-based plan, and so it's, it's, it's a little bit different. And so I think they're looking to take in part, and I, I don't blame them for this, control more control over the costs. If you have a third party administrator do it, it's a little bit different. So I think that is a component. I also, though, agree with you on the Amazon point that I think it is, um, it is in part looking to access at a lot of different points um, care for these individuals and to deploy that. But again, I think they're more in the business of healthcare, wanting to control costs, and not saying that that's bad, but I think the, the to come piece is how successful it will be in balancing, controlling the costs, and ensuring that people are getting the right care, that the other things, the social determinant piece, and that, again, you're dealing with an employed population, so it's a little bit different, I think. Um, so I think it, 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 it has a lot of qualities that we, as, as healthcare providers, don't necessarily see every day. So I, I just leave you with, with that piece, that it, it'll be interesting um, for sure, um, but it'll, be, it'll also be you know, how they treat their um, employees. I mean, they're gonna get complaints if things don't work out pretty well, right, uh, for them. But, but I just find, um, I, I see a lot of open questions with that one. John. This is, I think, a yet another very different kind of um, relationship that we're seeing. And so, from your perspective, what, what, what are you thinking about? Well, I'm not at liberty, of course, to comment on particular parties or individual plans. Um, so, but I want to say, generally speaking, that um, our agency is all about new entry, innovation, market-driven solutions. Uh, we're cheerleaders for, for free market, and, and so, so all of that is, is well and good. Um, we're gonna continue to look at um, new approaches, new structures from the point of view of the consumers. Um, we have no interest in protecting incumbent businesses or incumbent business models. So if someone comes into a business and says, you know, this, this, and calls our agency and makes a complaint and says, these, these, these new folks are doing X, Y, and Z, and they're going to put us out of business, it's like, well, um, that's an our problem. Not too bad. Um, <laughs> so, so, you know, it, the question is, is there a um, combination, a consolidation that's taking place that's going to be harmful to the consumers? We don't care whether it's harmful to the incumbent providers. So I think that that is um, great as our last long question. Do we have any questions from the audience? We do. All right. Good timing. <laughs> there you go. Um, so we do have a couple audience questions. Thank you for submitting those. The first is, where do you see the greatest future opportunities for strategic partnerships that will improve value? And it's not addressed to anybody in particular, so I think it might be open. I think it's one or the other of the two. Why don't you give it a start and I'll follow on. <laughs> um, I feel like asking, could you repeat the question to give me time to think, but I won't. Um, I, I really think it's data. I, I think that that has the greatest opportunity strategically. Um, obviously, there's a lot going on there, but I think ventures that include um, gathering of data to be able to um, to use that effectively is going to be the key. And I think strategically with, honestly, both providers and payers, but I do think that um, sometimes providers, unless they're the mega markets, don't always have the benefit <coughs> of the data and the history. I think um, through clinical trials and through other data in that way, I think that we will learn more as we see where things are going. So 
if I were sitting here, I would want to pair with and get more information on, on data and results and what we're seeing in the market in the market. I think that will potentially create the most efficiency and allow that artificial intelligence, that learning, um, I think will help people moving forward. And we're already starting to see it. Now I will say that with some of the um, proposed rules that are out there, some things are thrown a little bit off with respect to sharing of data and how that's really going to work. But I think it's being able to pull the, to strategically be able to use experience, history, solid data, um, and a history of data that uh, those strategic partners, partnerships I think will do well. So I'll build on your comment, Debbie, I, and you alluded to this in, in a word that you used in the process. I do think it's the data, and I think it's predictive analytics, and it's artificial intelligence, and it's the ability to redesign care delivery based upon the data uh, and redesign it in a, in a manner that moves care to the right location, which in all likelihood is out of the hospital setting in a lower cost uh, environment. The other piece that I think is a, a partner in that process is the ability and the willingness of our society to enable these innovators to become part of the new care delivery mechanism and not rely on the incumbents. I, I don't think the incumbents are going to get us there. I think it, it's the innovators that are going to drive the change and enable that. Do we have time for another question? I think we'll do one more question, yeah. Go this one is directed um, to you, John. How do you evaluate digital health tools and market power when a ubiquitous but non-traditional player enters the market with a new tool or service, parentheses, Google? Okay. <laughs> Again, not commenting on any particular company or a particular strategy. We're going to have to look at, at those from the point of view of the purchasers of, of that particular data service or that particular device. We have to look and see um, if it's a new entrant. You know, there's there's not a, a question of there being an anti-competitive consolidation or merger. Um, but if you have an incumbent um, buying up a new entrant, you know, you're looking there at a situation where you're, you're not limited only to existing market share, but you have to consider the um, somewhat slippery concept of potential competition. Thank you. So I think we'll wrap up with that. And um, I think our speakers will be here for a little bit longer after the program, after we come off the stage. So um, certainly feel free to ask additional questions. And please join me in a round of applause for all of them. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all very much.